I want to give you a glimpse of what I see when I see that C7. <laughs> be stuck there. I could then start experimenting with the half whole diminished scale. Hi, it's Tito. Welcome back to Jazz Mind, your online resource for learning jazz improvisation, learning how to make the trumpet easier so you can play the music that's in your head, and mindfulness for musicians. Before we get into this video, please like, comment, and subscribe if you want to know when my next videos are going to drop. And thank you for your continued support. I've been seeing some uh, tremendous growth on this channel, and I'm super excited at the momentum that we're building so thank you for tuning in so if you've been getting value from these videos please share them with your friends i would appreciate that so we have a problem in jazz and that is we're too scale centric in our approach to teaching jazz improvisation and i do believe that it starts way back with how we present the blues and the blues scale now when teaching the blues i also uh, use the blues scale early on, but within the framework of a historical perspective on how to play the blues and a huge emphasis on style and nuance and the intent and feeling that you put behind the notes. So the blues scale gives us a really nice, simple approach where less experienced improvisers can actually kind of move past the notes quickly to start thinking about these other really important things to an effective blues solo. But the problem is the seed that it plants, that all of the answers in the future, as you're starting to learn and dig deeper into jazz harmony, are going to come from scales. And trumpet players, you are notorious for this. I don't know if it's because we got three buttons only, that we really, really like scales. We like chromatic scales. We love stepwise motion. But when it comes to thinking in chords and chord tones, we've got some work to do there to catch up to our piano and sax playing friends. For example, when you see this chord, what do you think? This is a C7, sounds like this. And what's the first? Thing that you would think of. I would argue that a large majority of you might think, oh yeah, that's the mixolydian scale. So I play C mixolydian. That's the scale that matches this particular chord. And of course, from a theoretical standpoint, that's absolutely correct. But here's the issue. This is precisely where we get stuck. It happens so often that, oh, okay, once you kind of think you know the answer, C mixolydian, now the rest of your job is simply to pick out notes or change the order or create ideas within C mixolydian. My friends, that is not freedom. That is bondage. More importantly, I think we jazz educators often lose sight of the fact that for, for those new to jazz improvisation, giving them a seven note scale, that's a lot of options. It's very easy at that point to become overwhelmed, even with just seven notes. The other reality is that not all notes of the scale are created equal. This actually triggered a memory of when I was in college and uh, my friend Gene was a killing lead trumpet player. And uh, oftentimes I would be taking uh, a lot of solos and I'd go up in front of the band at the concerts and then I'd come back into the section after my solo. And often, oftentimes she would just look at me with a deadpan face and say, I heard you landing on the fourths. <laughs> Shout out to Jean. I miss you, Jean. 
Now, she was kidding. You know, I wasn't landing on the fourths. No. But, like, that's a problem, landing on the fourths. It's like a, it's a jazz joke. Like, you don't want to land on the fourths. When the new chord hits, you want to be landing on what? Chord tones. Something I tell my students all the time. You know, here we are thinking scales and stepwise motion and this type of thing. But a piano player or a guitar player who's playing behind your solo, they're not playing scales. They're playing chord tones. And so we as horn players, we as trumpet players, we got to start thinking more like piano players and guitarists. Now, we can't play a full chord, but we can play arpeggios and we can create ideas based on chord tones. So not only does this give us fewer notes to create with, which makes our jobs a lot easier, it's giving you the choice notes to use. So as you can see, thinking about the chord the, or the chord symbol opens up a whole umbrella of opportunities within that sound that go beyond just simple stepwise motion. I have an analogy for what this is like. I was watching a documentary a while back on comedians. In fact, the documentary was called Comedian, and it was about Jerry Seinfeld after he had uh, retired from his show and decided to commit back to stand-up comedy. But the movie really dives deep into the mind and the preparation that goes in to being a professional comedian. And let me tell you something. If there's one thing harder than being a jazz musician, it's being a professional comedian. First of all, you've got no band with you. It's just you up there and a microphone, and you have to make these people laugh. But they showed other young aspiring comedians and their process. And basically what comedians in general, what they do is they write jokes they try to word the jokes as perfectly as possible to get the funniest response. And then they begin to take it out on stage once they feel it's ready enough. And even at the gigs, they're going to be tweaking it. They're going to be trying new forms of delivery. They're going to change their cadence. They're going to change their dynamics. You know, certain parts that sometimes they'll do it softer. Sometimes they'll do it louder and, and see what works. And pretty soon what happens is they start to get a real feel for which jokes really hit the audience. And that becomes their A material. So they kind of save that stuff for the end. That is so similar to what a jazz musician actually does in terms of learning chords exploring harmony, taking it to the piano, learning the chord tones, improvising with it until you start to get comfortable making melodies out of it. And yes, scales are part of that umbrella. Scales are part of it. But to me, what's most important is that you learn the chord tones first, then you can connect between chord tones with the rest of the scale. And what ends up happening for us jazz musicians is that we develop confidence over not just individual chords, but of course, entire tunes. And by the time the comedian gets up on stage, they've already done these hours and hours and days and weeks and months of work developing that material so that it's automatic. All they got to think is family picnic and blind date. My mother-in-law tried to kill me. That's not real, by the way. It was just... And that process is so similar to the one that jazz musicians go through. That We have to get our harmonic knowledge and our chord scale relationships and our 2-5 approaches and, and all of that stuff. That's the nuts and bolts. That's the syntax. That's just language. That doesn't, that doesn't indicate necessarily ideas. But what you must be able to do is eventually, over time, develop fluency with those nuts and bolts. And then you begin creating using those sounds, first in the practice room, developing it, developing confidence. Then you take it out to the jam sessions or to the rehearsal, you start using it, and then you, you develop those things. And like the comedians, we're not thinking family barbecue, but we are thinking F sharp seven, B seven altered. More importantly, we're thinking, oh yeah, Stella by Starlight, How High the Moon. Or maybe that original composition that you wrote or maybe one of your colleagues wrote 
and you've practiced that tune, you understand the order of the chords for that particular tune. So you've built up confidence that you know you can sound good over that. But while you're up on stage, you're trying out things. You're feeling your way through. You're, you're starting to gain confidence to try new things in the moment. It's just like a comedian. Hopefully people don't laugh after we solo, though. I want to give you a glimpse of what I see when I see that C7. Now, I'm going to improvise off of the sounds that I'm thinking off of C7. But keep in mind, I'm trying to challenge myself with fluency over these sounds, which means it's one thing to just know the appropriate scale. It's another thing to really have it under your fingers, muscle memory, and begin creating sounds with it. So when I think of C7, I think of Mixolydian as well as, again, one of the sounds that I explore. But what about just the chord tones themselves? When I play the chord tones, I want to do it all the way up to the ninth. But another sound that I would think over C7 would be the notes of the major pentatonic scale. And I'm going to kind of blues it up a little bit by adding a blue note, I'm going to add the flat three to it. I can make a slight adjustment to the chord tones before I played one, three, five, flat seven, nine, I can make a slight adjustment and play my, my C major pentatonic, but instead of using the sixth scale degree, I'm gonna replace it with the flat seven. create a more modern open sound by turning this C7 into a C7 sus. To do that, I would I could play off of my G minor pentatonic. Or I could play off of my D minor pentatonic. But you see, to add spice to what I'm doing, I don't have to stay locked in to notes that only lie within C mixolydian. I can start throwing in some spice by adding a sharp 11 and playing off the Lydian dominant sound. Within that sound, I can play a D major pentatonic scale with a lowered sixth. Sounds like this. But why be stuck there? I could then start experimenting with the half whole diminished scale, maybe thinking like a C13 flat nine or something like that but the main scale I'd be using would be the half whole diminished scale. So as you can see, thinking about the chord itself opens up a whole world of possibilities. I do not have to be stuck in one sound because all of these sounds fall under the umbrella of C7. Now, again, I was just kind of giving you a glimpse of how I process it and how I think about this stuff. Now, if you want to develop your approach to 
chord tones and really expanding your knowledge of chord tones and your skill over chord tones. Here's a simple approach you can take. Think of the scales you know really well. Maybe perhaps many of you are very familiar with your major scales, for example. Learn this simple exercise where you're going to take the major scale up to the ninth scale degree, which is the same note as the second, come back down, and then follow it up immediately with an arpeggio, one, three, five, seven, nine, and back down seven, five, three, one of the chord tones of that. And I really want you to think, if you're in C major, think C major nine. That's the chord symbol. That's the sound. And all of these notes and groupings lie within that sound. <laughs> can do that in all 12 keys guess what there are only 12 of them you'll ever have to know 12 sounds like a lot but then you think wow there are only 12 right now you move to another scale why not take the building blocks of the 251 so maybe next go to your dominant uh seventh chords and your mixolydian scales so we're going to play a mixolydian scale all the way up to the ninth come back down Remember, Mixolydian is like a major scale, except it has a lowered seventh. That's kind of a shortcut way of thinking about it. And then follow it up with an arpeggio, one, three, five, flat seven, nine, flat seven, five, three, one. <laughs> you go to your minor seventh chords or minor ninth chords and do Dorian followed by one flat three five flat seven nine and so on and so forth. Now here's the kicker. When you start improvising over a tune, start with improvising only using chord tones first and develop fluency with that. Right now, I'm going to play through the chord progression to a tune that's very well known. Many of you, I'm sure, know it or have played it before. It's Herbie Hancock's Cantaloupe Island. We're just going to focus on the chord changes right now. And this tune happens to have four measures per chord. So, And there are three chords only that we'll have to learn in this tune. And I'm just going to show you... Like, you can create a very convincing solo even if you just play the chord tones. But remember, we got to develop familiarity with them. we got to develop fluency with them. And on the trumpet in particular, there's a reason we tend to prefer stepwise motion, whole steps and half steps, uh, because that's just they're just easier to manage on the trumpet. With chord tones, we, we are now skipping around and doing some wider interval leaps. So start slow and work your way up to fluency.
exploring the chord tones first is really going to open you up to a new level of harmonic accuracy. Your melodies and ideas are going to make more sense than ever. And when you combine it with the scale and you use the scale as connective material between chord tones, all of a sudden your ideas are going to take on a new life of their own. I hope you found this video helpful. It's time to go practice and work this stuff out. If you like this video, then like the video and leave your comments down below what you think of this approach. Is this something that you've tried before or is this something uh, that's opening up maybe a new, a new pathway for you in your improvisation? If you've watched my videos and you've gotten value from them, then please consider subscribing so that you know when every other video that I drop comes out. That doesn't sound right. So that you know when each new video drops. There we go. Have a great one, everybody. Thanks so much. Peace.